Magic and Murder. England, 1930. It begins when a gang of hooded thugs breaks into the secluded home of a modern-day witch deep in the mysterious new forest. Stolen is a map that will lead Indiana Jones and fiery fellow archaeologist Gail Parker to an incredible discovery. Somewhere in the world is hidden an enormous hoard of gold, including ancient coins from the time of Christ, coins meant to spread Christianity. With the aid of a young mistress of Wicca, the age-old religion of white witchcraft, Indy and Gale risk their lives on a round-the-world quest for the long-lost treasure. Racing them to find it is a cunning and ruthless criminal mastermind who has set his sights on world domination. But Indy and Gale have formidable weapons, the powers of Wicca, the sword of the legendary Merlin, and Indy's own adventurous brand of magic. Only magic can save Indy and his most dangerous adventure yet. Only magic and sheer force of will can get the reader through this slog of a book. Indiana Jones and the White Witch. Hello and welcome back to this damn full idealistic crusade. This is my next uh, in my series of reviewing and reading the Indiana Jones Bantam series of novels. And this, of course, means turning to the next book in the series and the second and final book to be written by author Martin Caden, which is Indiana Jones and the White Witch. Uh, this is uh, sort of a direct follow-up to his previous book because we do have the love interest character of Gail Parker recurring, and it pretty much picks up or, or tries to sort of follow where and pick up where the previous book, Sky Pirates, left off. Now, if you saw my review of Sky Pirates or you talked to most any indie fan who has ever read these books, the first thing everybody's going to say, and I myself included, is that Sky Pirates is a horrible book. It is not Indiana Jones at all and is just an impossible slog to get through. So I can thankfully say White Witch is at least better than Sky Pirates, but not by much. Uh, this is in a lot of ways equally as appallingly dull and a slog to get through, but at least there's not quite as much information about vintage aircraft, like the sort of technical manuals that you get in Sky Pirates where the book just stops. Um, and he does seem to behave a little bit more like himself, just barely. And uh, we, we do have the returning Gail Parker character who at least has some spirit and grit to her which you need in an indie love interest even though that doesn't really go much of anywhere uh, just like in sky pirates so this is basically more of the same this is a horrible book just like sky pirates don't get me wrong but at least it's better uh, but that's not saying much you know that's uh going and doing your taxes is more interesting than reading sky pirates so you know if, if, if that doesn't tell you i don't know what will uh so at least thankfully this is not only slightly better than sky pirates but most of all, thankfully, this was the only other indie book that Martin Caden wrote because he was a terrible choice to write these books. And uh, he seems to have just tried to uh, sort of mash together a basic plot idea out of historical elements that he thought fascinating and mix that into his science and aviation background, which is fine if you make it into a cohesive narrative that's actually, you know, interesting and, you know, does does the little things like actually do something with the love interest or write Indiana Jones to actually sound like Indiana Jones and feel like Indiana Jones and kind of have some understanding that Indy was based out of trying to revive the adventure flavor of a classic pulp novel or a especially a Republic cliffhanger serial, none of which you get in the books. But at least the Rob McGregor books had a, a nice handle on Indy's character and they were all these uh, sort of prequel building blocks uh, as, as sort of events that happened in, in uh, younger Indy's life that made him the man we see in the films. So whether you like all of McGregor's books or not, uh, or if you're like me and you think his delving into the um, sort of realms of magic and fantasy got went way overboard in his last two books. Uh, still, they you could understand what he was doing and where he was going. Uh, here in the Caden books, you just want them to end. You just want them to be over. That's how bad they are. Uh, so here in White Witch, to describe the plot, it makes even less sense than Sky Pirates. It does share a lot of the same problems. We don't really know a darn thing about the villain. We eventually get his name and his sort of background, but then he's hardly ever mentioned and then we only actually meet him at the very end of the book when he's dying. 
Uh, the book opens with uh, Gail giving Indy another flying lesson, although after all of the flying and talk of aviation in Sky Pirates, you would think that, uh, that they had covered all this stuff before. Um, so the book doesn't get off to a good start because it starts with another aviation sequence, and if you got through Sky Pirates, which was about mostly nothing but random aviation talk, you're like, oh crap, here we go again. Uh, but they basically see that uh, Gail's sort of childhood home this this village uh in that's actually a a, well i mean it's described a bunch of different ways but essentially you know if if you don't like having an overdose of magic and non-realistic elements in your indie stories well you're in the wrong place because the white witch of the title lives in this this village uh and it's actually where gail grew up and they're sort of uh bonded sisters in a way and this is actually a a village that is a wiccan village that uh practices magic and 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 also apparently has magical powers and can keep their village shrouded from uh ever from the outside world by making people see things and such but uh yeah they must not be super good at that because indian gale are flying around and suddenly see these explosions going off and then take a, a an absurdly long time to land said plane and then drive all the way out to this this place. You would think they would try to, you know, land next to it uh, and, and find that essentially a, a whole gang of mercenaries uh, who we don't know um, anything about at first has basically come in and just laid waste to this little village and killed most everyone and the leader of the village is the again the the witch i was referring to who is the sort of quasi relative to gail parker uh she fought them off and was apparently shot multiple times and is somehow still alive and we then spend an absurd amount of time wandering around this village after it took an absurd amount of time to get to this village because indian gale kept driving through weird visions and mirages because again the magical force field around this village that apparently the mercenaries didn't have to deal with uh so after spending Again, an absurd amount of pages to even get to the village and then trying to help the village recover and then figure out what the hell's going on. Eventually, we are kind of sort of let in on what's going on because this is another example of a really frustrating part of the Caden books. He likes to withhold information from the reader as a means to, I guess, extend the plot or the, 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 it's really infuriating. So if that bothers you that that and that was all through Skype, pirates uh, this happens yet again so this is just more of the same and that is not how you plot a book um but anyway, the mercenaries were essentially after a secret map that was drawn up many years before that apparently leads to a secret cache of gold, uh, some of which is apparently priceless coins dating back to the era of Christ and has some sort of ties to the church. And Indy's all excited about this, but for various reasons, this map was drawn up and left with this Wiccan village for safekeeping. And uh, apparently they... they uh, um, so, so somebody ha somehow magically found out about this, and instead of just trying to steal it, they broke their, their or apparently they just walked into the magical village and killed almost everybody and tried to make off with this map. And then Indy and Gale are on the pursuit. But they also have to deal with the witch character of Caitlin, uh, basically out on a mission of revenge because she's determined to uh, kill the leader of the mercenaries. Uh, so they now have a sort of double problem to deal with because they've got somebody with crazy magical powers who can apparently survive uh, any sort of... Uh, well, any sort of major wound, as long as she carries her sword and special garment, which is actually revealed to possibly be Excalibur itself, which has magical healing properties, but then the sword is said not to be Excalibur, and it goes back and forth about, you know, 10 or 20 times. And then it's revealed that apparently the magical uh, property uh, section of the sword was, in fact, taken off and then woven into the garment that she wears. So anyone who wears said garment as long as you don't get your head blown off or something uh, you can be magically healed from bullet wounds or stab wounds etc 
So yeah, Indy and Gail then finally go back to Indy's apartment in London, and we finally start to have some sort of plot movement. Again, the whole opening section of this book is absurdly long and goes back and forth, and Indy and Gail go and get the police, who are also some of the characters from Sky Pirates. So Indy's dealing with some of the same characters in uh, the British police forces, and especially MI5, MI6, so on and so forth. And even randomly a, a character from Italian uh, intelligence services because reasons we're not aware of. Uh, and then they even go all the way back to the magical village and can't get in. And then Indy spends a long time talking about mathematical equations, trying to explain the magical force field around the magic village while the police get really pissed at Indy and it's the, the readers beyond pissed at this point because this book doesn't get going. Uh, so we then finally have some plot movement and we're sort of introduced to who we guess the villain is, who is the character of Cordas, who actually has a bunch of different names and names he's had over the years and is some sort of uh, international criminal, arms dealer, a whole bunch of different things, but for various reasons, he just wants this hidden treasure and decided to break into the magic village he found out about and kill everybody to get it. So then it becomes a sort of race between Indy, Gale, uh, Caitlin on her mission of revenge with her magical powers, and uh, this villain we don't meet or really know anything about other than his basic setup and the fact that he's got a bunch of mercenaries with him. And uh, the story finally starts to move, but we've spent an incredible amount of pages even getting to this point. This is one of those books that not only you struggle to get through, but suddenly you realize you've read like 170 pages and you feel like nothing of a consequence had happened. Um, so when you do finish this book, it's, it's very hard to even think about the plot. As you can see now, it's very hard for me to even try to summarize the plot and, and go over the basic beats because there's really not that much that happens, but it, it fills up a whole full novel somehow. And if you thought we were done with aviation sequences, uh, Indian Gale realized that the answers apparently lie in the United States and they need to get there fast and try to beat the villains there. So, of course, they decide they're going to take a Zeppelin. So that means we have a 60 plus page entire section of the book where Indy and Gale are on this Zeppelin that is described in incredible detail. So we get yet more vintage aviation talk and technical discussion. But I will give Caden this, at least something happens in this section. There's also a little tiny dash of romantic tension between the two. There is an action sequence. There is more action throughout this book than the entirety of Sky Pirates, which automatically makes this better. So at least some stuff happens happens and there are some characters on the crew and there's some subterfuge and there's uh, a fight sequence and the somebody tries to sabotage the zeppelin so there's there's some stuff going on but it still takes forever and again the, the zeppelin supposedly being the fastest method of, tr of crossing the atlantic you would think this sequence wouldn't take a huge chunk of the book well guess what it does so if you're not a fan of vintage aviation talk and you hated sky pirates well you're still gonna to get some of that here but i give caden that at least he had something happen in, in this section and it kind of sort of makes sense uh eventually uh, after uh once again running into caitlin many times and having to uh keep her from killing everyone or getting herself killed they eventually all team up and then go into the final section of the book because all of a sudden the secret hidden gold is somehow tied to an old story of uh actually the american civil war so the whole in section of this book actually has indy gale and caitlin trying to beat the villain to this hidden cachet of gold which also apparently somehow has ancient coins of christianity uh that were actually given to the confederacy by england uh and trying to tie it into the section of the american civil war where the confederates were trying to get support and aid from european nations and this almost did happen so and and did in in some certain ways so this of course has historical basis as do the other events in this book so again that's just another point in Caden's favor that he did work in real historical events but that's you know 
there are so few points in Caden's favor, it feels weird to even highlight those because these books are unquestionably terrible. Uh, but the whole end section of the book has our, our trio searching for this gold, and uh, they're doing so in Florida, and they're they're looking around to basically going off on this trek uh, and dealing with the wildlife and the uh, villain and the gang of mercenaries who, again, we don't meet or encounter. We just hear about and hear our characters endlessly talking about them and also still kind of wondering exactly why we're worrying so much about just uh, some some hidden gold because, yeah, it's gold, but there's you know it's not like there's a magical property. It's not like you're searching for Excalibur in a magical garment that can keep anyone from from dying oh wait you already have that you've had it the whole book hmm uh but anyway it's it, you know this, this sequence actually does have some sense of plot movement it's you know effective enough but again we have no real presence of the villain until the very end we have characters able to suddenly use magical powers and even gale through in sections of the book is revealed to also have some magical abilities of her own which of course would have come in handy in the previous book and I don't think you need to have characters with magical powers in an Indiana Jones story. I think that is is way too much. Uh, but anyway, this builds to a climax where at least Indy does use his knowledge of history and a nice touch, but uh, the villain is essentially taken out off screen, you know, in, in terms of we don't even see it. We just see the aftermath and the villain is just kind of on death's door going, oh, we never found the gold. You'll never find it. Ha ha ha. And then Indy finds it in like five seconds and the villain's like, oh, crap. Except we don't even get that. You, you just have to infer that. And then suddenly uh, the, the book is over and we have this, this uh, epilogue section. And if this book wasn't uh, jarring and weird and uh, a slog to get through, then suddenly you get the rug pulled out from under you because the epilogue, uh, the Gale characters, nowhere to be seen. Apparently, she, she it's said that she just went off to South America and left Indy and everybody, so it's just Indy and Caitlin uh, back in London talking to some of the people, and they're like, oh, great, you you, you found the stuff, great. Uh, oh, yeah, that, that, that Gale lady, yeah, she's gone. She's done with all you people. And it's like, so two books of uh, hinted at romantic tension and bringing this character back and you're just going to have her disappear for the last few pages. So if this book didn't already leave an incredibly bad taste in your mouth while you were just trying to finish it, um, that that last little uh, flourish will will just really hammer it home that this is a terrible book. Um Yes, there are some interesting ideas. This could have worked if it had been competently written. I mean, in, in terms of structure and plotting, uh, it does not feel like an Indiana Jones story. Uh, it does not move like an Indiana Jones story. Like all of the books so far, it does not feel like the films. Um, and here, Indy's character doesn't seem really like himself. Everything is an improvement over the previous book. It does read better than Sky Pirates. It's a bit better than Sky Pirates, but it has all the same problems. It's just a little bit more palatable. There's a little bit more of an adventure flavor. There's some more action spread throughout, but this is a pain to get through. It is. I really had to force myself through Sky Pirates, and I had to do the same thing here with White Witch. Um... I would recommend only diehard indie fans or real completionists read these. I, I don't like to uh, badmouth things, but uh, sometimes you, you, you're trying to read something and it is just an absolute chore. And that's the two Caden Indiana Jones books in a nutshell. These are a chore to read. Um Somehow, some people like them. I don't know how. And the author does write a uh, an end piece at the end of each book, talking about the uh, artifacts and events that he references, giving you the real historical background, you know, which I guess is nice. But you've kind of already gotten those because when all these elements are introduced in the, in the book, the uh, book stops so you can get a, basically a lecture shoved in 
and uh, characters just exposition dump for pages and pages and pages. So it's like Indian Gale survived some sort of uh, action set piece and almost died, and then all of a sudden Indy's going to stop for like uh, two whole pages and give an exposition dump while Gale's like, I didn't know that. How do you know all this stuff, Dr. Jones? And this happens consistently. Um, uh, the book would have been better if it got going more quickly, and especially if we even gave a crap about the MacGuffin or the plot or knew anything about the villain or had encounters with the villain. Um, so, yeah, it's it's at least better than Sky Pirates, but that's like saying one root canal is better than two root canals. It's just... This, these are just not good. I mean, I, I find it baffling uh, that uh, Lucas, Lucasfilm and Lucas Books of the Time and Bantam uh, seemingly had no plan for these. And while, uh, you know, these two novels kind of, sort of are supposed to fit in the McGregor book universe of the first six books and have a fleeting reference maybe to those, they're also kind of their own complete different thing and then when max mccoy came in uh, in the next book thank god uh somebody else was reading these i mean anybody else at this point um uh, they also sort of are a, a sort of mini reboot but also are loosely tie into the continuity of the previous ones so basically the bantam indie novels are broken up by who wrote them so the first six mcgregor books are kind of their own thing the two horrible caden novels are sort of their own thing then the max mccoy books are sort of their own thing but you can look at them as a complete whole if you want to uh so uh, again i i if you're going to read the Bantam novels, you should go ahead and read all of them just to check that off your list. But I can tell you, you might like the McGregor books and return to those, and you'll probably like the McCoy books and return to those. But if you want to return to the Caden books, you're a glutton for punishment. Let's put it that way. Uh, these are just plain terrible. Uh, to quickly talk about the actual book itself, once again, the best thing about this and the most collectible aspect are the beautiful Drew Struzan covers. And here, Struzan has come up with a beautiful likeness of Ford. We have uh, the the sword, which is kind of maybe sort of Excalibur in flames. And on we have the, the knights on horseback. And we have the sort of wraparound cover effect with, I, I guess that's supposed to be the Caitlin character and of course the titular white witch so beautifully done and even though this is a later printing because you can tell it's got the bantam logo instead of the uh the falcon logo we have the tagline as all of these books do in their earlier printing saying indie which is always great but um even though this is a later printing it still has a nice gloss but the uh indie logo is embossed which if you've seen my other videos on a lot of the other books the embossing would get uh, removed on later printings so uh, this is one of the later printings where they kept the embossing and i think yeah this is like a an 11th printing and yeah it was done in april of 2008 so this particular copy is from the limited reprints that were done around the time of crystal skull and really the only positive <laughs> One of the only positive things about uh, Crystal Skull was that for a very brief, tiny window, uh, at least some of the Bantam indie novels got a limited reprint run. So uh, if you're looking for copies, which are all unfortunately hard to find and out of print these days, and pretty much have always been, um, if you're looking for copies now, most of the times you're going to find these slightly newer paperbacks, and that's because they had a, a number of them done for a short time in 2008 to coincide or, around uh, Crystal Skull. So like 2007, 2008, they did uh, some random uh, short reprint runs of the Bantam novels. Then I'll also mention really quickly that uh, we do maintain this sort of eagle sword and uh, olive branch 
motif uh, on the chapter headings that started in the McGregor book. So that is maintained throughout all the Bantam novels. So that is the one consistent identifier of the Bantam indie books along with the Drew Struzan covers. So unfortunately, I would not recommend this book, just like I would not recommend Sky Pirates to anyone unless you're an Indiana Jones obsessive or uh, you prefer your period adventure stories to have much more of a technical science background uh, or historical background in terms of just getting endless exposition dumps. I would say that both of these uh, books that Caden wrote are about Mm, at least 80% random factoids. <laughs> and the plot is secondary to everything. Um, and, I, you know, of the two, which is the better book? Um, but, you know, to say anything is better than Sky Pirates, and, and, and that's it's a small victory, you know. you got to celebrate the small victories when you're reading White Witch. At least it's just a teensy bit easier to get through you still have to force yourself along i had to go in spurts i mean i i really did not want to finish this that's how bad both of these books are uh but i, I was determined and i'm finally doing this read through so uh, just be forewarned these books are terrible and even the most diehard indie fan will struggle to find something of merit in these these are books that I doubt even the biggest indie fans are, are going to want to return to. So do keep that in mind. Um, but at least this is better than Sky Pirates. <laughs> so, uh, it makes you pine and yearn for the, the crazy days of indie tripping balls and fighting trolls and dinosaurs and ingesting magical fish juice with the uh, magical princess and interior world. I mean, that as crazy as that book got, at least it wasn't boring. So it makes you yearn for the, the craziness of the end of the, the McGregor book. So if, if that tells you how bad these get, so, uh, again, at, at, at the very least, White Witch is thankfully better than Sky Pirates, but not by much. So it's, it's really just more of the same. And I would not recommend either of the Martin Caden indie novels to anyone. And I will say that thank goodness at least the next book is by another author max mccoy who of the three authors of the bantam novels at least seem to have a handle on the tone of the films and even though i don't think they're perfect uh if you're reading through these and you really had to struggle through the caden books getting to McCoy's first book is just a total breath of fresh air. So at least there is there is some positive movement and the Bantam novels do end on a higher note because had they ended here, there's no way in heck anybody would ever talk about this series because these two Caden books would have uh, ruined their reputation so much that I don't think anybody would ever want to acknowledge these again. So those are my thoughts on Indiana Jones and the White Witch, the second and thank goodness last of the Martin Caden Indiana Jones Bantam novels. Uh, this is a real departure even from the uh, previous six books by uh, Rob McGregor. These are a real slog to get through. So I do want to warn people that uh, they, these are not the Indiana Jones you know and love. These are not the indie kind of stories you're going to be expecting. And you will really struggle through these because they're they're just terrible. So uh, if you've read these, I would love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. I just I would love to be able to commiserate with people <laughs> or or maybe find somebody who, who's able to see something more positive in these that uh, I just couldn't because um, I, I've read a lot of continuation novels and series novels over the years. I can really enjoy ones that other people like to pick apart. I can, you know, uh, put up with a lot of things when it's an author years down the road trying to continue a series. But there are times where even even that does not even uh, come into the equation, and, and this is definitely one of those times. So uh, if you've read these, I would love to hear your thoughts because th these are uh, just incredibly dull and awful and terrible and meandering and boring <laughs> words that you would never think would apply to an Indiana Jones story, but, you know. 
here we are. So as always, I hope my babblings about the world of our favorite archaeologist and the Indiana Jones world outside of the films and, of course, books and uh, book series has been at least somewhat fun and informative. Uh, please do check out the Bantam Indy novels if you can find copies. I know that's, that's rather difficult, but uh, uh, hopefully you can find some copies uh, by supporting your local used bookshop, which, of course, needs all, all the support that they can get to help stay in business. And as always, uh, keep reading, keep reading print books, and thank you ever so much for watching.